Hello everybody, welcome to Wine World TV, the best wine show anywhere. I'm your host, Mark Fusco. Now, before we get started, make sure you're smashing that like button and subscribing to the channel. Every like and subscription really helps build the channel. Even better, spread the word to your friends to the, about the best wine show anywhere. This is the first of my in-depth series on New Zealand wine, or the fifth in the overall series. This episode and the next two are all about New Zealand wine. These three episodes are going to be at a SOM school advanced level and will be intended for those of us studying for exams at all levels, really. This episode will cover overall history, wine law, climate, soils, etc. The next one will cover the North Island, while the third will cover the South Island. With that said, I'll be using the Court of Master Sommelier's Europe's uh, 2023 syllabus as my guideline on what to cover. I frequently call them the UK chapter because that's where they were founded, but they are officially called Europe, like the other one is called Americas. Anyway, CMS Europe has yet to release their 2024 syllabus, at least by the time I had written the scripts, which was back in December of 2023. Now, you may ask, why not use the American chapter syllabus? Well, because it doesn't exist on their website, at least the last time I checked, uh, something I and others have complained about the past few years. Either way, essentially the syllabus I'm using is valid for both sides of the pond. I have an extensive list of links for this episode in the description. This list will probably be the same for all episodes. I encourage you to explore further, especially the links directly related to this episode. While I try to limit these episodes to what the syllabus covers, I do include additional information for context or, well, just because I thought I think it's important to know for our professional lives. All right, we'll start with some basic history, even though the syllabus doesn't specifically mention it. Having, a knowledge, having knowledge of a country's history, and specifically its wine history, should be just assumed for any exam, regardless if a syllabus says anything about it or not. This is a summarized version, so not every single factoid will be included. The islands of New Zealand were the last large habitable land to be settled by humans around 1300, when the Polynesians began to settle in the islands. From these first Polynesians developed the Maori culture. The map I talked about in the first episode of the series uh, lists the Wairo Bar as where the first humans settled. This is the this is the kick-ass map as I called it, and these guys uh, gave me a shout out on Instagram. Uh, anyway, uh, I'll, I'll have a picture showing on the map where where that is. Um, anyway, the Maori word for New Zealand is Aotearoa. I think I pronounced it right. I probably didn't. The North Island is called Te Aika a Maui, and the South Island is called Te uh, Waipunamu. Man, I'm going to really struggle with the Maori words. There aren't a ton of, of, of these words in the series, but when they exist, I try to use them. Uh, or when I, I found them, I try to use them. In 1642, Ju Dutch explorer Abel Tasman first spotted the islands of New Zealand. They anchored off the northwestern part of the South Island. They encountered the native Maori tribe of that area, and a skirmish occurred that resulted in the deaths of four of Tasman's crew and one member of the Maori tribe uh, was shot at. Tasman subsequently left, and it wasn't until 1769 when another European, James Cook, came back during his project to map Australia and New Zealand. Shortly after Cook's visit, more Europeans began to visit to trade with the Maori. By 1832, James Busby was sent to New Zealand. He's credited with planting the first vines in New Zealand in 1836 for locally stationed British soldiers in Waitangi, where he resided, uh, a locality on the north side of the Wait Waitangi River in the Bay of Islands on the North Island in what is called Northland. I probably put a map up telling you where all that was or showing where it was. In 1819, a Christian missionary planted the first actual vineyard on the North Island. Eight years later, in 1840, Britain declared sovereignty over the two main islands of New Zealand via treaty signed with various Maori tribes, 
although not all of them had signed at the time. New Zealand eventually became a colony of the following year. Over the ensuing decades, New Zealand claimed other islands as its own. Other than a few larger islands, New Zealand has several hundred smaller islands. There are approximately 700 islands in total that are part of the country that span a large part of the Pacific Ocean. For our purposes, we only need to concern ourselves with the two large islands, the North and South Islands. In 1851, French Marist missionaries established a vineyard in Hawke's Bay for making communion wine. Now part of the Mission Estate Winery, it is the oldest commercial vineyard in New Zealand. William Henry Beetham is recognized as being the first person to plant Pinot Noir in Syrah, called Hermitage at the time in New Zealand, at his Lansdowne Masterton Vineyard in 1881. In 1895, the New Zealand government's Department of Agriculture invited the expert consultant, viticulturist, and enologist Romeo Brigato to investigate winemaking possibilities. After tasting Beetham's Hermitage, he concluded that New Zealand and Wairapa in particular were, quote, preeminently suited to viticulture. Uh, Beetham's French wife, Marie Zelie Hermans Frere Beetham, supported Beetham in his endeavors. Their partnership and innovation to pursue winemaking helped form the basis of modern New, Zealand, New Zealand's viticulture practices. Now, despite winemaking starting in the 1800s, many factors prevented a robust wine industry to happen until relatively recently. Even with migrants coming from various winemaking countries such as Croatia, France, Spain, and Italy. For a long time, it was beer and not wine that dominated the beverage scene. During the late 19th and early 20th century, the now worldwide problem problem of phylloxera came to New Zealand. Grafting onto American rootstock helped with this like the rest of the world. But that wasn't enough on its own to increase wine production. This was also the time when the temperance movement was influencing the production and consumption of alcohol. Again, this was actually something of a worldwide phenomenon. However, instead of a full-on prohibition like, the, like in the States, the New Zealand government imposed what was called a, quote, six o'clock swill law, in which pubs had to close at 6 p.m. The purpose was to ensure that men would be home at night with their families rather than out all night at the pub. This began during World War I and continued until 1967. Because there was a constant fear of, full -on, of a full-on ban of alcohol, there wasn't really a desire to plant high-quality grapes. Instead, ordinary table grapes were the standard for winemaking. That way, in case alcohol was banned, those farmers could at least sell the grapes well, as grapes. And most of these were not vitis vinifera. They were hybrids and were immune to phylloxera. So grafting real, really didn't matter. Then we have the worldwide depression of the 30s. Cheap wine on the market and wine shops not being able to sell wine by the bottle until 1955. Like, for real? <laughs> so they were super old school with a barrel and then sold it in large containers to people. That's kind of how I interpret all that. Plus, the main agricultural products during all this time was animals or livestock. Exports of dairy, meat, and wool dominated the economy. It still does to this day. As I mentioned in a previous episode, the New Zealand government divides its agriculture into six categories. In order of land use, here are the six from top to bottom. Sheep, beef cattle, dairy cattle, forestry, grain, and horticulture. Now this is basically everything else that is produce and includes vineyards. While this graph doesn't go beyond 2019, it's pretty clear that vineyards aren't going to overtake even grain anytime soon but the bottom three aren't seeing the noticeable changes, positive or negative, that the top three are. All right, enough of that. All of this is to say that you, will, that you obviously, that you'll see, you'll, so all this is to say that you will obviously see a lot of demarcated, demarcated plots of green land from above, but most of that is dedicated to non-horticultural product. Vineyards typically seem to be in more concentrated, smaller parts of each larger GI. So wine growing has been a very minor part of New Zealand's agriculture from just about the beginning. The 1970s is where the modern wine industry begins. We see this being true in a lot of New World wine growing areas, even true in some Old World areas. It began with Montana wines. They are now known as Brancat Estate, which is owned by Pernod Ricard, uh, the New Zealand branch, but ultimately by Pernod Ricard in France. They still use the Montana name in New Zealand, the name change was to avoid any confusion about wines coming from the state of Montana, because like that's a real powerhouse of winemaking. But 
why well, I digress. They planned Marlboro's first they planned Marlboro's first vineyards and produced its first Sauvignon Blanc in 1979 and actually labeled with a vintage and grape variety. This spurred additional plantings of varieties such as Muller Turgau, Riesling, and Pinotage, among other varieties throughout the country. But as happens with surges in plantings, overproduction happened. So in 1984, the government incentivized vine pulling. But the wine growers didn't really pull the vines. Instead, they used the money to do a wholesale shift of varieties planted concentrating on Chardonnay and the now iconic Sauvignon Blanc. They typically kept the old rootstock and grafted the new varieties. This coincided with better vineyard management, which led to higher, grape, higher quality grapes and wines. In 1985, Cloudy Bay breaks that, international, breaks that internationally. George Tabor proclaims that Cloudy Bay is, quote, the world's best Sauvignon Blanc. Others like Oz Clark and Mark Oldman effectively echo the saying, sometimes literally. Uh, plantings increase exponentially until, t until today. As of 2023, here are the totals for acreage under vine. All right, in Northland, there are 73 hectares of vineyards and they crush 182 tons. Auckland has 276 hectares, crush 709 tons. Waikato uh, or Bay of Plenty um, has 13 hectares planted, but zero tons crushed. Uh, Gisborne, 1,300 hectares, 10,967 tons crushed. Hawks or Hawks Bay, uh, is 4,805 hectares with 38,409 tons crushed. Wairapa is 1,089 hectares with 5,528 tons crushed. Marlboro is 29,654 hectares with 393,865 tons crushed. Nelson is 1,080 hectares with 11,472 tons crushed. North Canterbury is 1,464 hectares with 11,090 tons crushed. Central Otago is 2,054 hectares with 11,995 tons crushed. And Waitaki, uh, Waitaki Valley is 52 hectares and 210 tons crushed. Per the New Zealand Wine Grows Annual Report for 2023, total production by variety is thus. Sauvignon Blanc is 27,084 hectares or 64.7%. Pinot Noir is 5,678 hectares, or 13.56 percent. Chardonnay is 3,149 hectares, or 7.52 percent. Pinot Gris is 2,797 hectares, or 6.68 percent. Merlot is 1,061 hectares, or 2.53 percent. Riesling is 595 hectares, or 1.42 percent. Syrah is 443 hectares, or 1.06 percent. Cabernet Sauvignon is 204 hectares or 0.49%. Gewürztraminer is 192 hectares or 0.46%. Malbec is 95 hectares or 0.23%. Sauvignon Gris is 73 hectares or 0.17%. Cabernet Franc is 92 hectares or 0.22%. Viognier is 63 hectares or 0.15%. And then others come up to 334 hectares, or 0.80%. Yes, that adds up to 99.99% due to rounding. The point is that by far, Sauvignon Blanc is the driving force of the New Zealand wine industry at almost two-thirds the plantings. Pinot Noir, Chardonnay, and Pinot Gris are just shy of 28% combined. That leaves the combined total of the remaining grapes at less than 5%, 4.54% to be exact. So if you have that customer or guest confused as to why you don't have a New Zealand Syrah or Cab or Riesling, et cetera, it's very, very, it's very likely very little to none of these make it to out, make, make it outside New Zealand. There's always that one exception, however. Syrah is probably the most likely of that group to make an appearance as it's kind of a Somme favorite and kind of a specialty in one of the wine growing areas that we'll, we'll get to in another episode. Now, as far as exports, the top five countries are, I just made a bunch of numbers, you'll see the chart. To the United States goes 107,222 liters or 34% of the exports. That comes out to 870,505 New Zealand dollars or 526,517 US dollars. And that's 21.9% of the New Zealand dollars value. The UK gets 74 9,494 liters. That's 25.2% of exports by, by volume. 
by value, it's uh, 537,078 New Zealand dollars or 324,847 US dollars. And that's uh, by dollars, 22.3% of New Zealand dollars. Australia gets 69,504 liters. Um, that's 22% of the exports. Uh, that value is 443,726 in New Zealand dollars or 268,384 in US dollars. That's 18.5% in value of New Zealand dollars. Canada, A, eh, gets 12,900 liters. That's 4.1% uh, of exports The by volume. The value of that is 146,144 New Zealand dollars or 88,394 US dollars. That's 3.7% of the export value. And Germany gets 12,223 liters. That's 3.9% of volume. And the value of that is 71,137 New Zealand dollars or 43,027 US dollars. And that's 3% of the valuation of New Zealand dollars. The total exported to those five countries is 315,828 liters or a value of 2,404,975 New Zealand dollars or 1,454,627 US dollars. These five countries represent 89.1% in liters and 86% in New Zealand dollars exported. So yeah, we are by far the most important country to New Zealand at 34% in liters and 21.9% in New Zealand dollars. With that said, the UK and Australia are 47.2% in liters and 40.8% in New Zealand dollars combined. So they're also important markets. As far as we are concerned, it's essentially Sauvignon Blanc and Pinot Noir with a dash of Chardonnay, and Pinot Gris, Nilo Syrah. Otherwise, the rest doesn't matter for exam purposes. Yeah, it's cool to know certain areas are doing well with other varieties, and I'll cover that soon. But at the end of the day, very few markets, if any, will ever see those wines. Before we get into the Appalachian system, let's cover some geography. New Zealand is pretty isolated compared to many other places on Earth. It is both the easternmost and southernmost winemaking country. While some other islands in the major oceans may have more oceans separating them from other islands than New Zealand, due to its southern location, it wasn't along any normal routes taken by any seafaring peoples. Hence why it wasn't until the 1300s when the first Polynesians discovered it. It's considered the most temperate landmass in the world. The Australian mainland is its closest major neighbor at about 1,200 miles. Now, even though the country's footprint in the, footprint in the Pacific is larger than the two main islands, for our purposes, I'm only referencing these two main islands. So yes, the distances of any of the other 700 some odd islands to other places may be less. Of the two main islands, the South Island is the largest and lies on the same latitude as Tasmania. With that said, it does extend farther south than Tasmania. Its most important feature is the Southern Alps. These were formed from a collision of two geological plates. They are also part of what is called the Pacific Ring of Fire, a 25,000 mile long tectonic belt that circles the Pacific Ocean from New Zealand to Asia across to the Americas, ending in South America. It contains approximate, approximately two-thirds of the world's volcanoes and 90% of the world's earthquakes. The Southern Alps divide the island from northeast to southwest, with the narrow western part being rainy and the eastern part being much drier due to the rain shadow effect. This means the eastern part of the island has abundant sunshine hours. This allows grapes to fully ripen, but also due to the cooler nights, they can retain their acidity. While not as high as the Alps in Europe, they are significant. There are 18 peaks that are over 3,000 meters or 9,800 feet. The highest peak is Mount Cook, uh, also known as Araki, uh, at 3,724 meters or 12,218 feet. The Alps in Europe have 128 peaks higher than 4,000 meters or 13,000 feet. So they're in general much higher, but this is still a significant mountain range. Because the Southern Alps lie perpendicular to the prevailing westerly winds, what is known as the phone wind forms where the moisture-laden winds force air upwards, which cools the air and condenses the moisture and terrain at the top and then results in hot, dry winds racing down the eastern side of the mountains. In New Zealand, they call this wind the Nor'wester. This is the same effect we see in other parts of the world, such as the Zonda in Argentina, the Chinook winds around the Rockies, and Cascade Ranges, and the Fone or Favonio in various parts of Switzerland. Depending on when these major winds occur, they can both negatively and positively affect the vineyards. 
In the spring, when you have flowering, it can literally blow off the flowers, which results in less fruit set. It can also damage, to, uh, can also damage shoots and leaves, um, with leaf damage more likely in the summer. Later in the year, it can help with reducing fungus and other nasties. It can also thicken skins, resulting in higher tannins. In addition, it can impact the grapes by dehydrating them, so the timing of harvest and the wind is a consideration. However, from what I can tell, most of the vineyards on the South Island are not affected by this wind, or it's not mentioned in the research I did. But the Southern Alps do create a rain shadow effect. The closer to the Alps, the less precipitation happens. For reference, I've included the annual rainfall for some of the South Island's cities. Alexandra gets 359 millimeters or 14.1 inches. Tomorrow gets 548 millimeters or 21.6 inches. Lake Tekapo gets 592 millimeters or 23.3 inches. Christchurch gets 618 millimeters or 24.3 inches. Beinheim gets 711 millimeters or 28 inches. And Queenstown gets 749 millimeters or 29.5 inches. Other than Alexandra, most of the other cities and towns receive at least 20 inches of rain, which is considered the minimum amount of annual rainfall for viticulture. But, as we've seen over the years, it's not unusual for droughts to occur even in areas that normally receive 20 inches or more of rain per year, and New Zealand is no exception. West of the Southern Alps, rainfall can be anywhere from 2,000 millimeters or 78.7 inches to 6,700 millimeters or 263.8 inches. We don't find a lot of vineyards east of the mountain range, but some do exist on the northwest part of the South Island. This is in comparison to places that are classified as deserts or close to it, such as Red Mountain, Washington, that gets 7 inches annually, Barossa Valley in Australia that gets 6.3 inches, Mendoza, Argentina gets 7.4 inches, and even the Santa Rita Hills, California, gets 12 inches, which is a couple inches more than, than a desert, considered a desert. Anyway, the North Island doesn't have the mountains of the South Island, however, it does have active volcanoes. With that said, there are many plateaus and flat areas in contrast with the South Island's many mountainous regions. As a result, rainfall is much higher on the North Island, often twice the amount Christchurch gets of 618 millimeters or 24.3 inches. While it's on a latitude the equivalent of Jerez, Spain, its climate is much closer, closer to that of Bordeaux. Overall, both islands are considered temperate, no dry season, warm summer, per the Köppen Geiger climate classification. Just about the entire North Island is this classification. Around Alexandra on the South Island is classified as arid steppe cold due to its proximity to the Southern Alps. Cold in this case means winter, not summer. Mean annual temperatures range from 10 degrees Celsius or 50 degrees Fahrenheit in the South to 16 degrees Celsius or 61 degrees Fahrenheit in the North. The coldest month is usually July and the warmest month is usually January or February. Generally, there are relatively small variations between summer and winter temperatures. Mean annual temperatures range from 10 degrees Celsius or 50 degrees Fahrenheit in the south to 16 degrees Celsius or 61 degrees Fahrenheit in the north. The coldest month is usually July and the warmest month is usually January or February. Generally, there are relatively small variations between summer and winter temperatures. An example of this is Auckland, which has a variation of just 9 degrees centigrade or 16 degrees Fahrenheit between the average midwinter high temperature of 14.7 degrees Celsius or 58.4 degrees Fahrenheit and the average midsummer high temperature of 23.7 degrees Celsius or 74.7 degrees Fahrenheit. It's March 5th and it's already hotter than that here in San Antonio. All right, temperature variation throughout the day is also relatively small. The exception to this is inland areas and to the east of the ranges with daily variations that can be over 25 degrees Celsius or 77 degrees Fahrenheit and differences up to 14 degrees Celsius and 57.2 degrees Fahrenheit between the average summer and winter high temperatures. Given that the country is mostly between the latitudes of 34 degrees and 46 degrees and our islands, it's understandable that the climate stays pretty consistent throughout the year and on the cooler side of things. In addition to this southerly location, it's in close proximity to the annual ozone hole over the South Pole. Future mark here. When I create these videos, I accumulate all the extra things like pictures or data I'll put up as different graphics. Most of the time, this is during the writing of the scripts. But I will also do this after I've recorded the episode and I'm editing everything. 
I may not have thought about looking for a picture to help explain a point. I almost always do all the Google Earth Pro pictures and videos during the editing process. And many of the graphics that are done in Final Cut Pro are also done at that time. So when I got to this part of the video, I wanted to find some kind of picture of the ozone hole to show that it extends at least to the South Island of New Zealand, especially since well, many of the sources I use for this part essentially said this happens. Well, wouldn't you know it, nowhere can you find any kind of picture that shows the Antarctic ozone hole extending over New Zealand. In fact, there's typically more ozone over New Zealand when the hole over the Antarctic is at its largest. Well, how can that be? So I headed down the rabbit hole. It turns out that New Zealand's higher UV radiation is not primarily due to the proximity of the ozone hole in general. While there can be some effect, it's actually for three main reasons. One, overall, the Southern Hemisphere has higher UV radiation due to the Earth's elliptical orbit. The Earth is closer to the Sun during the Southern Hemisphere's summer, which contributes to a 7% increase in UV. Two, the Southern Hemisphere has less ozone, not due to the hole, but because of how the generation of ozone works. The Southern Hemisphere is 10% more efficient in distributing ozone from the equator to the higher latitudes in the summer months, which, which leads to less ozone. In other words, it's dissipating faster, so it has a lower concentration. This is when the hole is at its smallest or closed. Three, New Zealand specifically has cleaner air. Pollution scatters UV radiation more, and New Zealand has less pollution than many other areas. I'd argue that the Southern Hemisphere as a whole has less pollution as well. This last point is normally cited as one of the reasons for higher UV, but the hole is considered the main culprit in the wine world, or at least maybe not the wine world, but other, you know, you hear people say that's why. The fact is, when the ozone hole is at its largest starting around September and October, which is Southern Hemisphere spring, New Zealand has its highest concentration of ozone. While I didn't find any specific reason looking at pictures and video about this phenomenon, my guess is that as the hole expands, it creates a wall. As the ozone forms at the equator and moves to higher latitudes, this wall compresses the ozone, meaning higher concentration. We can think of it kind of like a rain shadow effect or an ozone shadow effect um, when you have really high mountains. So when the hole is forming and it starts expanding, it extends all the way up into the top of the atmosphere. So ozone can't get over those mountains. It's not a hole in the sense of like, um, like a hole in the ground where you're on the surface, the ozone's on the surface and it drops in because the ozone is the least amount. So it's pushing the ozone away from the, from the, ant, from the South Pole and then it's hitting all the ozone coming from the equator and now you have a higher concentration of ozone. That's what it looks like what's going on. When the hole closes in the summer, then more normal ozone concentrations occur. Now, a normal concentration of ozone is around what's 300 Dobson units in general, and New Zealand, uh, and New Zealand's average ozone levels fluctuate between 260 and 360 Dobson units. The lows happen from about February to April, which is during harvest, while the highs happen from about September to October, as I kind of mentioned. This is around the start of growing season. With all that said, I found an article that mentions the prevailing winds during the spring will briefly expand that hole over New Zealand, but now I can't find it unless I find it between now, between when I record now and um, uh, I do finish editing the video and I'll put a link in there. Uh, but the hole definitely affects the climate of the earth and the Southern hemisphere, but not in the way we think. And you will find news articles that blame the hole, but the prevailing scientific thought is it's a minimal effect. Now, there are multiple links in the description for you to check out, so please check it out. But uh, I wanted to clarify that point because I took it as fact, and when I tried to find something to illustrate it, I, I, I spent like two hours at three in the morning trying to figure it out. All right, back to past Lack of pollution, the amount of UV radiation in New Zealand can be 40% higher than the equivalent northern latitudes. So people and grapes are more susceptible to sunburn. For the grapes, that means proper canopy management. Soils in the North Island are dominated by sedimentary basins and alluvium. Additionally, there are significant volcanic soils, followed by gray wacky. The South Island is a mixture of sedimentary, gray wacky, and haast schist. 
Now, gray wacky is a signature soil of New Zealand. While it is found in a few other places in the world, none of them have significant viticulture. To quote, Vicky, Wiki, to quote Wikipedia, to quote Wikipedia, it is, quote, a variety of sandstone generally characterized by its hardness, dark color, and poorly sorted angular grains of quartz, feldspar, and small rock fragments, or sand-sized lithic fragments set in a compact clay-fine matrix. It is a texturally immature sedimentary rock generally found in Paleozoic strata. The larger grains can be sand to gravel size, and matrix materials generally constitute more than 15% of the rock by volume, end quote. In general, most of the vineyards are planted on flat land, even on the South Island with its mountainous topography. Very little plantings happen on steep slopes. This is not to say they aren't on any hillsides, but typically all viticulture is on flat land. This is probably due to the heavy use of mechanical harvesting. Manual labor is hard to find in the country, any hand harvesting is minimal since the labor force that is normally used for wide-scale manual harvesting is done by migrant workers. Not just here, but the entire world. With their isolation, it's not economically feasible in most cases to rely on this. Australia also has a similar problem, but since they have a much higher population, manual harvesting isn't as rare, and they, they do have a higher percentage of migrant uh, workers for, for harvesting in agriculture. Now, in contrast to Australia, you don't find massive irrigated vineyards. New Zealand is tiny compared to Australia, especially if you're looking at Riverland in Australia or even places like the Central Valley in California. So you won't find a lot of bulk wine here. Uh, instead, the grapes will be of an overall higher quality. It doesn't mean you don't find any bulk wine. It's just not a major thing. Uh, all producers and growers are members of the New Zealand Wine Growers Organization. Because of this, they can present a unified front for the industry. This is for interacting with the government, but also important for marketing New Zealand wine to the world. One of the things that New Zealand is best known for, well, besides Sauvignon Blanc, is the screw cap. They weren't the first to have widespread use, but they pioneered an organization called the Screw Cap Initiative in 2001. They committed to using it even on premium bottles. Australia and New Zealand suffered from getting the lowest quality corks for many years. So, at the, so the adoption of the screw cap was a conscious effort to guarantee better quality wines. Over 95% of New Zealand's wines use that enclosure. Labeling laws are pretty simple and straightforward. A wine with a variety must contain at least 85% of those grapes. Same goes for a wine with a vintage. This is the same for the EU. If the wine is labeled with a GI, then 85% of the grapes must come from that GI. Again, the same for the EU. Now, when it comes to spirits labeled with a GI, that number is 100%. New Zealand, however, is much like its other world, New World counterparts. They do have some basic regulations about the production of wine and making sure it's safe. They don't regulate irrigation, yields, RS, acidity, etc., like you find in many EU countries. When it comes to processing aids, also known as additives, it's a bit unclear. Australia and New Zealand fall under the Food Standards Australia New Zealand Governmental Organization. So while each country is its own sovereign country, they also partner with, with some governmental things such as this. The actual website is part of the Australian government, but it appears to regulate food safety for both countries. However, we're looking at the legislation regarding processing aids for wine. This is where we're a little unclear if, if the approved list is for both countries or just Australia. Some acts make it seem like it's both countries, but when you look at the actual list, it'll, it'll say Australia only. <laughs> Late into the script writing process of the series, I've finally found the rest of the regulations concerning wine. Essentially, New Zealand is like most other New World places. As long as it's considered safe or known as good manufacturing process or practice or GMP in New Zealand, then it's allowed. We use the term GRAS, grass, or generally recognized as safe. Now, that doesn't mean red dye number five is added to wine, but grape concentrate can be. Uh, there is a list of additives that are allowed. They differentiate using common fining materials from additives and call them processing aids. We call all of them processing aids in the U.S., though we also loosely or generically use the term additives like within the industry. The additives are broken down by products, all products, not just alcoholic beverages. Processing aids are just one long list. One interesting note is that New Zealand has a maximum of 
200 parts per million for SO2 for wines less than 35 grams per liter of RS and 400 for those over. Um, that's kind of high compared to some of the other parts of the world that, that you can find that regulation. Other additives have maximums, but they almost all say GMP. As of 2024, all alcoholic drinks will need to have the following on their labels. An accurate name or description, amounts of alcohol, pregnancy warning label, net contents, allergen and advisory statements if applicable, a best before date if applicable, storage instructions if applicable, number of standard drinks, business name and physical address, the lot or batch ID, nutrition information panel only if you make a nutrition content claim. Now some of these won't apply to wine. The allergen statement is similar to the EU where if an allergen was used in the manufacturing of, of the beverage, even if it's technically not present afterwards, it still must be listed. So things like isinglass, egg whites, and dairy used in the fining process will need to be listed. At least that's how I interpret all this. Another interesting thing, New Zealand law forbids wine or beer or their equivalents to be sold in grocery stores if the ABV is 15%. Hmm. So I guess that high octane wine that's not fortified is relegated to the liquor store. I wonder if that's a holdover from the prohibition days. Also, the ABV tolerance is 1.5% either side, uh, no matter what the actual ABV is, unlike the United States. I think the EU has a similar thing in the United States, where if it's below a certain, per certain percentage ABV, you have one range. If above, you have a different range. Now, how much of this last bit is really even remotely relevant for an exam? Probably none of it. It's more of a personal thing for me, kind of relating to the research I was getting into for this episode. New Zealand does have regulations concerning organic products, including wine. This is handled by the Ministry of Primary Industries. Essentially, it's similar to other programs in that organic food is made without using the following. Most synthetic fertilizers and pesticides, some medicines like antibiotics, growth hormones, food additives, most synthetic chemicals, Organic food also cannot be genetically modified or irradiated. As far as additives for wine, I'm guessing that as long as the additive is considered organic, then it's okay. A third-party company approved by the government handles the actual certification process. This is also pretty standard around the world. The last overall subject I'll cover uh, in this episode is New Zealand's sustainability program. This is really where New Zealand's focus is. They were the first country, or at least one of the first countries, to implement a national program for agriculture, not just for vineyards, but all agriculture. This began in 1991 with the passage of the Resource Management Act of 1991. In 1995, the Sustainable Growing NZ, or New Zealand, or SWNZ, was established. According to their website, it was one of the first to be established in the international wine industry. And I believe they are the first as, as far as an entire country. Lodi Rules may be the first organization for the wine industry as a whole, having been founded in 1991, but that was actually a grassroots educational thing before becoming an official set of standards much later on. Anyway, this is a non-governmental organization that promotes sustainable viticulture via the New Zealand Wine Growers Organization. The organization is funded via legislation, however, so while it's not part of the New Zealand government, it is funded by them. All winemakers and grape growers are required to become a member and pay levies on their sales. The funding is via three ways. A levy on the sale of grapes collected under the Commodity Levies Act of 1991, a levy on the sale of wine under the Wine Act 2003, and user pays activities and sponsorship. I don't, I don't user pays act, activities, user paid activities and sponsorships. I, I, I'm pretty sure I copied this verbatim, like copy pasted, but I might have messed that part up. Through the SWNZ, compliance with all the legal stuff for sustainable wine growing is done. Annual submissions have to be completed via online questionnaires to stay certified and independent audits are conducted regularly to ensure they comply with their six focus areas. Now these areas are soil, water, plant protection, waste, people, climate change. This last one is more recent. These focus areas are pretty standard across most other sustainability programs. In addition to the questionnaires, vineyards must submit a full spray diary every year. This will list all agrochemical applications, also known as sprays, uh, that are used. This is to ensure that a vineyard is only using approved sprays. What are those approved sprays? Hell if I know. I spent quite a while trying to find that list online. 
I reached out to two people or organizations that should have had that list. And as of the date of this recording, which was March, March 5th, neither got back to me. So we're talking like three months later, no one got back to me. Anyway, the point of that is that sustainable isn't organic per se, not just New Zealand, but all programs. They tend to be as organic as possible, or at least use chemicals as little as possible. This is usually via targeted applications rather than spraying an entire vineyard. That means constant monitoring of the vines to prevent or minimize the spread of pests, diseases, weeds, etc. The Sustainability Program in New Zealand has a, lot, has a lot of resources for vineyards to use to look for these issues in order to mitigate them. Also, not all non-organic sprays are the same. Some are less toxic than others. Some have shorter half-lives than others. Responsible use is the key and finding the right sprays, organic or not. In addition to this, New Zealand is a very humid country overall. Humidity is the bane of agriculture in general and even worse for organic. And while some chemicals are allowed, oftentimes these programs promote the use of organic-only sprays as the preferred choice. But being organic isn't just the point. It's back to the six areas of focus. Yes, chemical sprays can affect the soil, water, and plants. Responsible use is possible, but it's also making sure you're not being wasteful and taking care of your employees. The last one, climate change, ties into most of these as well. So while the targeted use of a chemical spray might be okay for sustainability, massive and constant use of them won't get you to your goals. I really view certified sustainable programs as a reasonable approach to farming. Do as little harm to the environment as possible, but recognize you are a business at the, end, at the same time. And in order to even have the ability to take care of your people, you, well, you have to stay profitable albeit in a responsible way. It's absolutely possible. I, I've got a direct link to their standards below, so be sure to check them all out. All in all, they're pretty much the same as I've seen elsewhere. All right, we're at a stopping point, so I'll end this part here. The next two will cover each island separately, north then south. If you enjoy what I'm doing, make sure you hit the like button and subscribe, and then tell your friends, and then we'll see you next time.